Excellencies, colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Warm greetings from Abu Dhabi, and welcome to the special Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week discussion with John Kerry. I'm Hannah Al Hashmi, the head of the United Arab Emirates Office of the Special Envoy for Climate Change, and I'm honored to moderate this discussion. And allow me to also warmly welcome our keynote speaker, uh, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate Change of the United States. <coughs> um, Secretary Kerry, uh, really climate change is the defining defining issue of our era um, and maybe the defining opportunity for the next generation. Uh, we're speaking today in the sixth year since the adoption of the Paris Agreement and just eight years until our 2030 deadline uh, for ambition. So thinking just coming out of COP26 in, in, in Glasgow and as someone who was involved in, in so many of the negotiations and discussions there, what do you see as the major takeaways and achievements from COP26? Well, Hannah, first of all, thank you very, very much for including me, for inviting me. Um, I give my very best to the leadership of uh, the Emirates and thank them for their extraordinary efforts. And please also extend my greetings to uh, Dr. Sultan Al Jaber, who's been a terrific colleague to work with. The principal uh, advance that came out of uh, Glasgow is not insignificant. It is the fact that 65% of global GDP made legitimate commitments that have been analyzed by external sources and judged to be capable of keeping 1.5 degrees alive as a goal, as a limit on the warming of the planet. And um, the challenge now is to work with the other 35% and bring people on board as rapidly as possible in order to try to meet that goal. Uh, we know that the warming is, is going on at an accelerated rate, at a record historic rate, particularly in the Arctic where ice is melting much more rapidly. It's warming uh, several times faster in the Arctic than anywhere else on the planet. And as the ice melts, it opens up dark blackish ocean, which then contains more heat and that accelerates. So you have a negative feedback loop. And if you look around the world, we know that there are many more, the mudslides, the fires, the intensive storms, the floods. I mean, you could run a long list here. So the bottom line is that Glasgow accelerated the efforts of almost every country to try to uh, meet the goals that we've set for ourselves. In addition, there were many individual commitments outside of what we call the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs. There were individual announcements made, for instance, by the UAE and their role of a, as a leader uh, helped to create the um, a, a, a innovation, the agriculture innovation mission for climate, which came out of the UAE. This is a terrific piece of leadership and it will help deal with methane and other emissions from agriculture, CO2, et cetera. Uh, which is critical on a global basis. In addition, everybody agreed that we have to come back next year, not in five years, 10 years, but we have to come back next year and make uh, an assessment of how fast we are proceeding. Are we living up to the commitments? Are we not? And there's a new era of visibility through satellites so that every country is gonna be held accountable without even reporting because people are gonna be able to measure what's happening with deforestation, what's happening in terms of the carbon footprint of big corporations and countries. So we also finished what's called the rule book, the Paris rule book, which is now complete so that people have a better sense of the rules of the road with respect to carbon credits, carbon trading. Uh, there's uh, rules of transparency and accountability and reporting. So I think we've made a big leap forward. Now, bottom line, Hannah, no one is moving fast enough. We literally are, are, are way behind in our retirement of coal powered plants, in our efforts to stop leakage of methane, in our efforts to deploy renewable energy. Uh, we need to do a lot more, a lot faster. And I think that is gonna be the center of the debate going forward now. 
Thank you, Secretary Kerry. Uh, well, let's let's talk about what's next in that case. You we mentioned coming back next year. We're very much looking forward to the COP coming to the region uh, with COP26 in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, and then COP28 here in the UAE. How have you seen the climate conversation evolve in this region? And what opportunities do you see in the coming years for global and regional progress on climate? Well, it, it, there can be no question but that there has been uh, progress, uh, significant progress, in the embrace by countries throughout the Middle East uh, and Africa, uh, all of whom have joined together to to really recognize the seriousness of this challenge. Every country in the world, Hannah, is now feeling the impacts. There's nobody who's, uh, who is you know, being given a buy here. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, thanks really to the UAE that early on stepped up. When I first came into this job, um, I was in touch with uh, uh, the leadership of uh, the UAE. And we talked about trying to do an, a, a, a Middle Eastern conference on climate, which is somewhat uh, of a surprise to a lot of people. And we did it. Uh, and we had about 11, I think 11 countries there from the Middle East, four or five gas and oil producers, all of whom signed on to a very strong statement about the urgency of making a transition to cleaner fuel and to containment, to uh, carbon capture, storage, utilization and to developing the new technologies that we need in order to get where we're going. So there's been a sea change. I mean, just think about it. Egypt hosting uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh, the next COP, COP27. And then right after that, the UAE hosting uh, in the Emirates. So the region is stepping up. And uh, I think it's an extremely important message to the rest of the world that folks who are producers of the current source of our power and energy and heating and so forth, recognize that there will be a transition. It doesn't mean there won't be some usage and some continued efforts. Of course there will, because we know there are even other products other than energy and heat that depend on petroleum base. But clearly we are moving towards clean power, renewable power, sustainable structures. And I think uh, the Middle East uh, together with the Horn of Africa is going to play a huge role in that over the course of the next two years. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And it's it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you on from, from the beginning of this new role of yours on, on the Regional Climate Action Dialogue and to see the region come together, um, as well as to continue that discussion with the Middle East uh, Green Initiative and Saudi's Green Initiative. Um, I do want to jump and maybe touch on what you had mentioned earlier um, about methane and the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate um, as, as a related topic. I think that's one area uh, where the region has really um, come forward and shown uh, how uh, hydrocarbon producers can also um, be a part of the solution. Of course, the region has among the, the lowest methane emissions in their production. Um, so I'd love to, to hear more about, of course, the Global Methane Pledge um, from, from your perspective as one, as the, uh, one of the major outcomes uh, from Glasgow uh, and, and uh, how that can, can work together in, with other initiatives such as the Agriculture Innovation Mission and why we need to continue prioritizing reducing methane. Well, Hannah, um, thank you for asking that question because it's really key. Methane is, um, in, in the first 15 years or so after it is used, uh, either, you know, pumped and, and uh, uh, taken out of the ground in the form of gas, gas is, is about 87, 88% methane. And the problem is that methane leaks. It leaks at the pump, it leaks in the production stage, it leaks for the burning, it leaks in transportation. And methane is 80 times more damaging than CO2 for those first 15 years or so. That is a serious problem when we look at the fact that over the next 10 years, we have our greatest challenge in trying to reduce our emissions by 45% uh, minimum. So to achieve that, methane must be part of the solution. And for whatever reasons, it's been sort of the stepchild of the process. Nobody has uh, really focused in on it until this year, President Biden announced our initiative with the EU. And together we're working 
to try to bring every nation on board. We have 109 nations that have now signed up to the methane pledge. That pledge says that we will all work together to begin to plug the leaks, to close the mines, to, to uh, plug the uh, old wellheads, et cetera, which are still leaking. And we will do our best to try to reduce the thawing of the permafrost, which is releasing massive amounts of methane that's been contained for tens of thousands of years. Now we're seeing that released with the thawing of the permafrost. Russia has a particular problem with respect to that. So uh, methane, however, is one of the easiest things to try to deal with. It's not expensive to begin to plug these wells and holes and mines. It's not expensive to stop the leaking. It's low end technology to do these things. But the gain we get by reducing methane emissions is one of the largest benefits, easiest benefits you can get to the whole challenge of climate crisis. If we can achieve our goal of reducing the global issue, this is global, so no one country is being required to reduce by 30%, but globally, we hope to reduce the emissions by 30% by everybody's individual efforts. And if we do that, that will be the equivalent of every automobile in the world, every truck, every airplane, every ship, literally going to zero emissions in that period of time. That's a gigantic gain for all of us. It saves about 0.2 uh, of a percent uh, on the rise of temperature during those 10 years. And that would be a remarkable gain right now. Absolutely. Speaking of step changes and an engagement of all sectors, and uh, we're almost at time, but I would really love to hear your, your perspectives. Is you've spoken about keeping the 1.5 degree target alive um, and the need for everyone to be on board. What about the private sector um, and financing from the private sector? How can the private sector best support and accelerate the transition um, and unpack economic opportunities coming out of climate change? Well, Hannah, the private sector is the key, uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that for the sake of pumping up the private sector, but the, but the simple reality is no government in the world, as wealthy as some economies may be, no government in the world has the money that is required to be able to affect this transition, to accelerate it. But the private sector does. And in the course of Glasgow, with the uh, Glasgow Finance Alliance, with the Banking Alliance, with the Asset Owners Alliance, with various efforts around the world, we identified over $100 trillion that's ready to go invest in these new technologies, in a smart grid, in the deployment of renewable energy, in the battery storage, in carbon capture and, and utilization. I mean, there are many different things. Hydrogen, for instance, a lot of people are beginning to look at hydrogen. The reality is that it's going to need a very significant amount of investment to affect this transition. So we, for instance, in, in the U.S. have formed a partnership together with other countries with India to try to help India be able to bring the finance and the technology to the table so that they can meet their goal of 450 gigawatts deployed renewable energy. That's a terrific goal. Prime Minister Modi uh, has shown real leadership here in trying to achieve this goal. And if India does achieve it, or when it achieves it, India will be in compliance with the 1.5 degrees. So this is a big deal. And, and what we want to do is bring more of those trillions of dollars to the table in order to unleash it in this transition. It's not giveaway money. People need to recognize that. It's money that is going to look for projects that are legitimate investments. Energy can be that because energy produces revenue. Transportation produces revenue. Uh, you know, certain fuels produce revenue. So we have the ability here to be able to finance in the open market. And that's why I say it's so critical because, uh, you know, companies will be able to make money. People will be able to, to service loans. But in the doing of that, we will be able to accelerate significantly the deployment of this new energy future. And, and that's the secret. So I think the private sector is uh, really the most critical partner here. We've got to bring them to the table. We have to do some de-risking. 
We have to do some blended finance. We have to be creative about how we deploy that money. But there's no question in my mind, it's better to be investing in a big solar field or a new energy product that will produce revenue rather than to leave your money sitting in a bank or in a parked facility somewhere with net negative interest where you're paying for the privilege of, of being there. So I think there are a lot better ways to deploy the funds and we're gonna be working on that very, very hard with you and with other countries. I'm very excited, Secretary Kerry. Unfortunately, we've we've run out of time. Um, I, would, I would love to continue the conversation. However, I think that this is a great note uh, on, on which to, to pause it from now and continue it hopefully offline. Um, really, thank you so much for, for your insights today. Uh, we've covered how, you know, coming out of Glasgow, we were at the the level of ambition with 90% of the world's economy under net zero targets, um, which is quite an, an, a, 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 a fantastic feat coming right out of a, a global pandemic uh, with 65% uh, committing to keeping 1.5 alive. And the trick now is how to implement um, and how to move forward and drive forward uh, action in time for, for next year and the year after when we take the global stock take in, in the UAE. Thank you. Thank you for outlining all of that and, and some of the concrete steps that you're taking from, from, from methane to to aim um, and and uh, financing the energy transition. Uh, thank you all very much to, for for participating today, and goodbye from Abu Dhabi. Thank you, Hannah. Bye bye.